Welcome to the first in a series of lectures this year on the general topic of religious experience. The series is part of a research project in the Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology at the Danielson Institute at Boston University, funded by the Metanexus Institute, which is supported by the John Templeton Foundation. My name is Robert Neville, and I am the executive director of the Danielson Institute and principal investigator of this funded project. In addition to the lecture series, the project includes a collaborative research program of a group of scholars of religion from many disciplines in the Boston area, as well as a credit-bearing graduate course that is adjunct to the lecture series and taught by Professor Brian McCorkle, a psychologist who is the director of the Danielson Institute's Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology. Professor Wildman will be teaching a graduate course in the spring on religious experience. Two guest lectures will be given in January and February by Professor Jay Shulkin of Georgetown University and Anne Harrington of Harvard, respectively. The main part of the lecture series, however, consists of six serial lectures on the topic religious experience, colon, from the mundane to the anomalous by Professor Wesley J. Wildman of Boston University. This evening is the first in Professor Wildman's series. Dr. Wildman is Associate Professor in the Philosophy, Theology, and Ethics Department of the Boston University School of Theology, where among other things, he directs the doctoral program in Science, Philosophy, and Religion. He took a bachelor's degree with honors in mathematics at Flinders University and a graduate degree in divinity from the University of Sydney, both in Australia. He completed a PhD in philosophical theology, systematic theology, and philosophy of religion from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Since coming to Boston University in 1993, he's published a large book, Fidelity with Plausibility, and edited with Mark Richardson a collection of state-of-the-art debates on issues in religion and science. He was also co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Science and Religion. He has published over 60 articles in theology, ethics, and religion and science, many of which have come out of collaborative group projects, such as those of the Vatican Observatory Group and the Boston University Comparative Religious Ideas Project. Religious experience, is a topic on which Professor Wildman has researched, taught, and written for the last decade or more. Please join me in welcoming him to deliver his first lecture entitled, What Do We Think We're Doing? A Framework for Interpreting Religious Behavior, Belief, and Experience. Professor Wildman. It's very nice to be here this evening. Thank you for coming out. What is the point of studying religious and spiritual experiences? What can we hope to achieve intellectually and practically? These questions are more difficult to answer than they might seem, but they are also fascinating, so I think it's worthwhile pausing at the beginning of a series of lectures to consider them in some detail. Some years ago, in Montreal, I had a private conversation with Dr. Andrew Newberg. After he had delivered one of his fabulous stump speeches on the neurophysiology of religious and spiritual experiences, having become well known for studying expert meditators using functional imaging of the brain, Newberg had colourful resources to draw on for his presentation and it was entertaining. The lecture was also pregnant with hints about the wider philosophical significance of the research. So when we met, I asked Newberg about the philosophical point of the study of meditation experiences. I noted that many in his audience that day were enthusiastic about his research and spoke as if it had produced evidence for the authenticity, the cognitive reliability and the spiritual value of meditation experiences. I asked Newberg if he thought his data justified such a conclusion. He said he thought that the data justified neither that conclusion nor its opposite. Then he told me that when he makes the same presentation to groups who tend to view religious and spiritual experiences in a negative light, they are equally enthusiastic 
and take his research to confirm the delusory and unhealthy character of such experiences. So when all was said and done, my question about the philosophical point of Newberg's research remained unanswered. But I was left with a puzzle that continues to bother me even today. Why do intelligent people get excited in opposite ways about the neural embedding of religious and spiritual experiences? What do they think such research reveals about the truth or falsity of religious and spiritual beliefs? Or about the disvalue of religious and spiritual behaviours? There seems to be much more popular excitement around such research than there is clear understanding of its significance. Much the same applies to the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences. Experts agree that social groups condition the way such experiences are felt and expressed and that this embedding can magnify their political and economic effects in spectacular ways. For example, sociologist Max Weber argued convincingly that particular patterns of religious behaviour, beliefs and experiences among Protestant Christians produced a distinctive form of economic practice that led to capitalism. Well, now that's all very important, but what do we think research into the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences reveals about the truth or falsity or value or disvalue of religious beliefs? And why do people get excited in quite opposite ways about our growing knowledge of the sociality of religious and spiritual experiences? Well, this state of affairs bothers me so much that I've given it a name. I call it the dongle phenomenon. A dongle is a seared, sealed hardware device that allows copy-protected software to run on your computer by means of a process that dongle distributors do not want you to understand. Basically, you know that a dongle is important, but you have no idea why. The neural and social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences is a premier instance of the dongle phenomenon. We know these forms of embodiment are important, but we really don't know why. Newberg's story about opposite reactions to the same talk makes the point perfectly. But I want to know whether we can penetrate beneath the shallow enthusiasm and superficial scepticism that so many people bring to the discovery that the brain mediates religious and spiritual experiences, and to the equally important realisation that social groups condition such experiences. Well, we probably can go deeper, but it's not easy. And here's why. The neurology and sociality of religious and spiritual experiences defines an extremely complicated network of possible linkages among the natural sciences, the medical sciences, the human sciences and the humanities. Some authors even argue that quantum physics is vital. This network of linkages is so complicated that most people only register a fraction of the possibilities. Those they see first are typically the ones that match their background and experience, and thus their preconceived ideas about the value or disvalue of religion. But one's first thought in this domain might be quite mistaken, and further study can thoroughly complicate those instinctive preliminary convictions. In this lecture, I want to commend a framework for interpreting religious and spiritual experiences that can help untangle the maze of possible implications surrounding this topic. I shall explore different aspects of the framework in subsequent lectures in more detail. Throughout, I shall attempt to be clear about the values that guide my own research and thinking in this area so as to expose my interpretation to sustained scrutiny and constructive criticism which is the best way to take responsibility for it and the best way to improve it. Now, I use the word framework, but the grid-like connotations of that word are quite misleading. The territory of religious and spiritual experiences is wild and rambling, containing enormously more varied and colourful flora and fauna than most people realise. It reaches from near-death experiences to out-of-body experiences, from feelings of oceanic calm to dramatic conversions, from sudden bursts of unaccountable compassion to routine participation in religious rituals, and from centering meditation to the busy joy of shared meals in a religious community. It is a landscape that invites exploring and resists definitive classifications. So I propose a compass to guide that exploration. In fact, in honour of the complexity of the subject, I offer two compasses, 
each orienting explorers to a different dimension of the territory. The first compass orients us to practical purposes in studying religious and spiritual experiences. We all know that motivations matter. A compass of motivating concerns can help us be responsibly self-aware, appropriately suspicious, and steady in judgment. The second compass orients us to classic theoretical issues in the study of religious and spiritual experiences, each of which has a complicated history and lively contemporary manifestations. If we want a sound understanding of such experiences, we will have to work for it, and that will involve penetrating these difficult issues. In each case, where appropriate, I shall illustrate the variety of motivating concerns and theoretical issues by referring to particular debates, writings or thinkers in the territory of religious and spiritual experiences. My hope is that in this way, this pair of compasses can serve both as orientation to the possibilities for exploration and as a survey of existing forays. Now, as a final introductory remark to the whole series of lectures, really, we need to clarify a key piece of terminology. <clears throat> My favourite phrase to encompass the territory we will be exploring is religious and spiritual experiences. This is unwieldy, but shortening it presents problems. If I abbreviate it to spiritual experiences, I risk emphasising individual states of consciousness at the expense of corporate and tradition-guided forms of experience. If I abbreviate it to religious experiences, I risk failing to register the fact that many people who don't even consider themselves religious have such experiences. And if I invent a new phrase, I will just confuse everyone. So I shall use religious and spiritual experiences as often as possible, despite the awkwardness. I'll speak in the plural most of the time in recognition of the fabulous diversity of the experiences under discussion. And though my focus is on experiences, I shall often use the phrase behaviours, beliefs and experiences to indicate that experiences are inextricably intertwined with behaviours and beliefs. Finally, I shall assume that religious and spiritual experiences have neurological and social embeddings that are subject to more or less rigorous scientific study. All right, let's get going. The first compass tells us something about why we might be motivated to explore the landscape of religious and spiritual experiences. Now, this compass won't encompass or capture the intricacy of each one of your interests. But most people can relate to at least one of the four motivating concerns that I shall discuss. We do well to be aware of these possible dimensions of motivation. As we shall see, there is evidence that here, as in all human endeavours, guiding interests sometimes unduly influence interpretations. A non-religious scientist friend approached me a few years ago and told me about a spectacular personal experience that seemed loaded with religious and spiritual meanings. This person was deeply moved but also confused by the experience and wanted to know what it meant and whether it could be studied in a way that a scientist could appreciate and take on board with integrity. The aim was neither to explain the experience away nor to justify its apparent meaningfulness and the emotional framing was neither desperate nor indifferent. My friend wanted to satisfy intellectual and spiritual curiosity. Natural curiosity about a fascinating range of phenomena and a drive for authentic self-understanding is a large motivating factor for many students of religious and spiritual experiences. In the interest of full disclosure, I should say that I am curious too. Insofar as I'm a philosopher, theologian and ethicist, however, I engage topics because of their significance for a wider understanding of the human condition, as well as to satisfy my intellectual and spiritual curiosity. Those philosophical and theological interests take me far beyond the official borders of the natural sciences and human sciences into the hinterlands of philosophy, where descriptions fail and inquiries routinely break down. A second motivating concern is the need to manage the social and political effects of religious and spiritual experiences. One of our New England forebears and the most famous American philosopher prior to the 20th century was Jonathan Edwards. 
A brilliant man, Edwards was also a Christian pastor at the time of the Great Awakening in this part of the country. Much like the charismatic movement within Christianity of the 1970s and 80s, the Great Awakening produced spectacular experiences in the lives of Christians who were open to them. The experiences changed lives in a mostly healthy and pro-social direction, which was good, but they also caused havoc in the churches, including Edwards Church. Well, as an intellectual, his solution was to investigate these experiences carefully and write a book about it. So in 1746, there appeared the religious affections in which Edwards completely failed to express his subtle thoughts in ways that could have any effect whatsoever on his target audience. Nevertheless, the book is remembered by specialists because of its determined attempt to distinguish gracious and authentic religious experiences from counterfeit or inauthentic ones. Edwards was particularly careful to emphasise the importance of loving behaviour and to criticise as misleading the emphasis on the fervour of religious and spiritual experiences. Through his formidable sermons rather than through his book, Edwards exercised a salutary influence on the unfolding of the Great Awakenings. This is an excellent example of studying religious and spiritual experiences in order to exercise social control, but it is by no means the only one. Carl Rove studied the religious experiences of born-again Christians in the United States in order to appreciate how to leverage their voting tendencies for the benefit of the candidate he promoted. Now he didn't study their born their voting excuse me, he didn't study their born-again religious experiences like a psychologist would or an anthropologist might, and he probably relied a great deal upon his own intuition and experience, but he certainly learned how a politician could connect to those experiences and to the moral and religious sentiments they engender. Anthropologist Scott Atran has invested a lot of energy in interviewing jihadists in the Middle East in an attempt to understand how their religious and spiritual experiences lead them to make the choices they do, from forming political opinions to becoming suicide bombers. Presumably understanding this process could have a beneficial effect on interactions between Western and Islamic cultures. Then there are the people who fervently believe, with a passion rivalling that of the most fervent religious fundamentalist, that religion is bad for you, bad for society and bad for the global human future. For example, physicist Steven Weinberg once said, religion is an insult to human dignity. With or without it, you'd have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. For good people to do evil things, it takes religion. Now this seems to neglect the unprecedented violence of totalitarian regimes during the 20th century, but Weinberg does have a point about the way people use religion to rationalise bad behaviour. According to biologist Richard Dawkins, philosopher Daniel Dennett, astronomer Victor Stenger, writers Sam Harris and David Mills, pundit Christopher Hitchens, the UK's National Secular Society, the USA's Freedom From Religion Foundation and numerous other, really countless other individuals and organisations, we would be far better off without religion. In a March 28, 2007 debate on the proposition we'd be better without religion, in London, Dawkins said that, quote, there are very good grounds to believe that there is no actual truth in the claims of religion. I rather liken it to a child with a dummy in its mouth. I do not think it a very dignified or respectworthy posture for an adult to go around sucking a dummy for comfort. For those unfamiliar with English English, a dummy is called a pacifier in this country. If Dawkins is right about this, then religion is an infantile attachment that produces comfort through misunderstanding. It really would be more grown up to, do, to be rid of it. Well, since it is not obvious how to rid the world of religion, this task requires quite a bit of thought. Unfortunately, for the anti-religionist who longs for this cultural transformation, there are very few successful models from which to learn. After all, the attempts of some Stalinists to kill off religion failed, and the USSR collapsed under the overbearing weight of an inspiring but impractical socio-economic vision. Some Marxists wanted to witness the withering away of religion as economic conditions gradually eliminated the deprivation that Marx thought causes it. But so far their longings have been in vain. Anyway, the anti-religion evangelists are committed to democracy and non-violence. 
So they are limited to consciousness raising and education efforts. Thus, it's not surprising that they turn to the study of religious and spiritual experiences as a weapon in their war against religion. For example, Dawkins describes religious and spiritual experience as the delusional result of the human brain's simulation software. Quote, this is really all that needs to be said about personal experiences of gods or other religious phenomena. If you've had such an experience, you may well find yourself believing firmly that it was real. But don't expect the rest of us to take your word for it, especially if we have the slightest familiarity with the brain and its powerful workings. With a proper education, argue Harris and Hitchens, children can be liberated from religion. They can be taught that the brain occasionally throws off misleading experiences with huge emotional and existential significance and thereby freed from their intrinsically persuasive effect. These anti-religionists are equal opportunity haters of violence and superstition, whether it is authoritarian religion or absolutist politics. With John Lennon, they imagine a better world with no religion too. And the path toward that better world involves freeing ourselves from, among other things, the impression that our religious and spiritual experiences are as important as they seem to be. Now let's consider a third motivation that people bring to the study of religious and spiritual experiences. I shall relate three personal experiences and then ask what they have in common. First, several of my friends, disciples of the Dalai Lama, want me to practice meditation. They are confident that my experiences while meditating will demonstrate to me the transient and ephemeral nature of reality, thereby freeing me from my attachment to the big and small concerns of life and sparking within me a powerful form of compassion for all living creatures. The experience will change my life and bring meaning and purpose that I never imagined possible. Second, several of my new age friends urge me to try any number of ways of connecting to the flowing energies just beneath the surface of ordinary life. Their Taoist-like worldview predicts that I will have powerful experiences of feeling centered, energized and healthy to an unprecedented degree. The experience will change my life and bring meaning and purpose that I never imagined possible. Third, several of my evangelical Christian friends want me to experience the presence of the risen Jesus Christ as a living personal being, constantly communicating with me and being my companion in the trials and joys of life and my guide to the life beyond. All I have to do is to confess my sins, welcome Jesus Christ into my life as my Lord and Saviour, and love him and follow him with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. The experience will change my life and bring meaning and purpose that I never imagined possible. So I ask you, what do all these experiences of mine have in common? Well, obviously a number of people are trying to convert me to something. And evidently I come across as the sort of person who could profit from a conversion experience. <laughs> but I want to draw your attention to something else, namely the role that religious and spiritual experiences play in these conversion efforts. I am being asked in the final instance not to be a Buddhist or a New Ager or an evangelical Christian, but first to have an experience that will speak for itself. My friends are confident in their beliefs because the religious and spiritual experiences they have had feel so compelling to them and they feel like they confirm their beliefs. They believe that if I have these same experiences, then I will naturally believe exactly what they do. Religious and spiritual experiences are the not so hidden power source for the health and vitality of most religious movements. When diverse people reinforce each other's beliefs and encourage each other to adopt similar interpretations of potent experiences, their individual commitment to the group's doctrines and goals soars. They become like-minded. They know what they believe. They feel comforta confident about how to behave and have companions with whom they can share some of the deepest parts of themselves. For me to have powerful experience in Tibetan Buddhist meditation confirms the almost scientific predictions of Buddhist doctrine and thus helps to legitimate Buddhist religious identity. 
if I am healed and strengthened by resting with a crystal over my sixth chakra or third eye, then I may become convinced of the wondrous spiritual depths of the natural world, thereby confirming the New Age worldview and contributing to the piece-by-piece piece legitimation of that loose-knit social identity. If I viscerally feel the presence of Jesus Christ with me, I will confirm in my own experience the truth of Christian claims about God and the world and thus participate in the person-by-person -person legitimation of that movement's identity. Given the powerful role that religious and spiritual experiences play in nurturing religious movements, it is no surprise that some people study religious and spiritual experiences specifically in order to protect and strengthen the identity of a religious or spiritual group to which they are already thoroughly committed. It's a kind of apologetics. The Dalai Lama encourages the neurological study of meditating monks in part for this reason, and in part as an artful way to spread enlightenment. In fact, he is impressively open about his motivation. Some people study paranormal phenomena because they seek scientific confirmation of experiences that have been extremely meaningful to them. Some people study glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, because they long for scientific confirmation of what they most dearly believe about that phenomenon, namely that it is a genuine language and not merely regressive babbling in a socially acceptable context. And some people are powerfully motivated to study religious and spiritual experiences in order to show that they are delusions, thereby confirming their deeply held anti-supernaturalist and anti-religious worldview. The particular studies I have alluded to may be properly designed and accurately interpreted, but because of the presence of these sorts of motivation, there is real reason for caution when approaching the study of religious and spiritual experiences. Articulating the identity of a religious group, explaining and justifying truth claims made by a religious group, protecting a religious group from misunderstanding or distorted representation, and attacking religion as delusion, are all valuable activities from certain points of view, but the danger of bias is very real. It is a case of caveat emptor, or buyer beware, because the seller may not even be fully conscious of how their special interests can distort the interpretation of, religious fi of research findings and become special pleading on behalf of a religious or anti-religious doctrine. Unfortunately, we can rarely be certain about a researcher's motivations in this area. Few people are as open as the Dalai Lama about their reasons for supporting the study of religious and spiritual experiences. So we have to focus carefully on the quality of studies, remembering the dangers. The final motivating concern I shall mention is the quest for personal transformation. I must confess to having a guarded respect for people who explore religious and spiritual experiences because they want to break bad habits and forge good new ones through religious disciplines, or achieve enlightenment through meditation, or recover mental and physical health for themselves and others through shamanic interventions, or cleanse the doors of perception within theogens so as to see the world as it most truly is. These people are the adventurers in the realm of religious and spiritual experiences, and I've been honoured to know a number of them. They make me aware that I take refuge in the precise evidential requirements of the sciences and the disciplined interpretive practices of the humanities, making micro-moves and trying to build expert consensus. Meanwhile, these bold explorers of the territory of religious and spiritual experiences blow right past my scholarly caution with a wink and a nod just to see what's out there. It's not that I want to be like them, but I can't help admiring their boldness. I recall once standing in front of a window high up in a San Francisco skyscraper during a birthday celebration. As I took in the sight of that beautiful city, an old man in ill health, an acquaintance rather than a friend, walked over to stand beside me and admire the view. He told me a remarkable story of a near-death experience that he had recently undergone after a cardiac arrest and how it had transformed him from a bitter man, fearful of death, to a person ready to face his demise with dignity and confidence. Whether or not this man's reaction was warranted, his near-death experience did, in fact, change his life. Yet this experience was completely unsought 
which of course is typically the case for near-death experiences. The thrill-seekers of religious and spiritual experiences feel envious. They want such experiences for themselves. And if near-death experiences are inconvenient, then they will go for whatever they can get. It is the awesome power and compelling beauty of such experiences that inspires adventurers to seek them actively and cultivate them deliberately. Think about it, there has to be something wonderful about meditating in the context of a monastic community because such experts in the terrain of altered states of consciousness renounce, renounce a lot of other wonderful life activities that the rest of us embrace with joy. And something other than a spiritually empty high brings religious experimenters with mind-altering substances back again and again to what some of them call their sacrament, which might be LSD or a special type of mushroom or something else. These people know a lot about altered states of consciousness and their religious and spiritual effects from direct experience. They learn to control the powerful emotions and interpret the vivid imagery that can accompany such experiences. Shamans might be overwhelmed by psychotic states of mind at first, but gradually and with practice, they learn how to control the disruptive and disturbing experiences that afflict or bless them and turn them to the benefit of others in their community. The saints and bodhisattvas did not become great in the art of compassion by accident. They cultivated their chosen religious goal with the same determination, discipline and desire that drives greatness in all forms of life, from business to sports. Nothing I've said about these great explorers implies that they are correct in the way they interpret their experiences. In fact, I think that philosophers reflecting at a distance may be better at evaluating truth claims and assessing interpretations than those who go through these experiences personally. First-hand experience might be existentially compelling, but potent experiences are not always self-explanatory. Those who go through them often fail to detect the cultural and personal assumptions that they bring to their interpretations. Moreover, and this is especially important, the human brain seems capable of producing confidence in beliefs in more than one way. Usually, for normal experiences, we instinctively evaluate new ones, new beliefs, new ideas by matching them against the whole sweep of existing knowledge. But a sufficiently powerful experience can swamp us, can override that global matching process and produce extreme confidence without the normal checking and evaluation. Because of this second possibility, we cannot take at face value the enthusiastic certainty demonstrated by the bold adventurers in this, room, in this realm. Nevertheless, these adventurers are the definitive experts in the qualities and effects of such experiences and also in how to master them and how to bend them to specific religious and spiritual goals. They possess invaluable information as a result and it would be foolish for a philosophical interpreter of religious and spiritual experiences to exclude their testimony just because they do things that make cautious philosophers feel uncomfortable. Unfortunately, this happens from time to time and the philosophical interpretations are impoverished as a result. For example, some philosophers, such as Wayne Proudfoot and Stephen Katz, insist that it is impossible to allow for cultural and contextual factors in mystical experience. They neglect or marginalise the reports of experts in meditation to the effect that, with time and practice, though not at the beginning, it is in fact possible to gain insight into the constructed character of the meaning we attach to such experiences. That's one of the fundamental planks of Buddhist meditation at an advanced level. These philosophers speak as if their own more prosaic experiences were normative and thereby eliminate an experiential possibility that people with more experience actually realise on a daily basis. Yet it is also easy to appreciate the core concern of these philosophers. Just as they say, to put the point bluntly, most people undergoing such experiences are blissfully unaware of the role contextual factors play in generating their interpretations and beliefs. An experience of a presence is obviously Jesus to some, but obviously the Virgin Mary to others. It might be Krishna in South Asia, or perhaps an angel or a demon, or perhaps a disembodied spirit or a dead relative all depending on cultural and social conditioning. 
Philosophers are obliged to point out this problem, especially when other interpreters naively take religious and spiritual experiences as transparently self-interpreting. Nevertheless, philosophical caution should apply in both directions. We should not take self-reports at face value, but neither should we rush to assert what is and what is not possible in the realm of controlled experimentation with altered states of consciousness, particularly when our own more limited experience functions as the standard for judgment. With this we come to our second compass. <clears throat> this one identifies four classic theoretical issues. Religious and spiritual experiences influence what people believe, how they behave, whom they vote for, and what they are prepared to invest energy in, what they feel driven to resist. They bring great satisfaction and peace of mind, but they can also disturb and disorient. It is because of the pervasive existential and social importance of religious and spiritual experiences that so many vital questions have arisen about them. We need to register one problem at the outset. As mentioned earlier, a bewildering array of disciplinary approaches impacts the important theoretical issues to which the second compass orients us. Each disciplinary contribution represents a kind of tactical move in the exploration of the landscape. Some describe phenomena, some link levels of description, some detect causality, some discriminate effects, some integrate information into coherent interpretations, some evaluate value and truth. Our framework for interpretation should help us register the diverse data and theories that are relevant to ensure that interpretations integrate multiple levels of information, to resist monodisciplinary simplification, and to accept that even experts may have to learn new perspectives and approaches. None of this is easy, but nothing less can produce a truly satisfying interpretation of religious beliefs, behaviours and experiences. So the first theoretical issue concerns the psychological, social and evolutionary origins of religion. Let's start with the roles that social context and psychological formation play in producing the particular content and quality of these experiences. We know that cultural context is important. For example, Hindus do not have experiences of the Virgin Mary and Christians do not have experiences of Krishna. We know that family context matters a great deal. For example, Muslim and Christian families growing up in a predominantly Hindu community tend to produce children whose religiousness matches that of their families. And we know that a community's interpretation of historical circumstances matter. For example, if secular Jews in the United States become religiously involved in a religion other than Judaism, they are more likely to become Buddhists than Christians. The history of Jewish-Christian relations appears to be the key factor in this tendency. There is no shortage of theories that link psychological dynamics with religion. Sigmund Freud personally produced several of them in books such as Totem and Taboo, The Future of an Illusion, and Moses and Monotheism, with further pregnant hints in Beyond the Pleasure Principle and Civilization and Its Discontents. Other thinkers before him and after him speculated along similar lines. The basic thought here is that human beings have built-in impulses and desires that are powerful, often conflicting with one another or frustrated, and almost always operating below the level of conscious understanding and control. These structural dynamics produce all kinds of behavioural and cognitive consequences, many of which are emotionally coloured by anxiety and neediness. This creates readiness for experiences that ease anxiety and meet emotional needs, regardless of how plausible or implausible the beliefs associated with such comforting experiences may be. It also creates room for social groups that vest ritualised bonding processes with ultimate significance and thereby power to comfort pain and relieve anxiety. Similar theories link social dynamics with religion. A foundational figure here is sociologist Emil Durkheim, his insights were drawn from tribal religions but have proved relevant to modern day. The key insight here is that human beings are a social species living in chaotic circumstances. Nature is sometimes chaotic but you can count on social life to be chaotic. 
We need rules to tame social chaos, but what rules could possibly induce unruly humans to comply? Any rules backed by overwhelming punitive force tend to provoke rebellion, so this approach is socially unstable in the long run. Durkheim noticed that religion facilitates willing compliance with rules, which is a far superior arrangement. Religion achieves this feat by vesting the core moral principles of a society with ultimate significance, weaving the rules into a compelling narrative that helps people simultaneously make sense out of their lives and tame social chaos. To express it in theistic terms, religion exercises social control by writing human rules on the vast cosmos with divine ink. This cosmologization of rules inspires willing compliance partly through fear of divine punishment and awareness of divine scrutiny and partly because religious and spiritual experiences under these circumstances yield reassuring orientation in chaotic life circumstances. It works, in other words. These psychosocial interpretations give theoretical depth to critiques of religious and spiritual experiences that skeptics have pressed since ancient times, and they continue to press them today. According to this critique, religious and spiritual experiences are for weak and anxious and needy people, the gullible folk who are easy to manipulate and control. Yet, a careful philosopher is quick to point out that these psychosocial interpretations do not entail this critique. Here is a pro-religious interpretation of the same facts. Freud and Durkheim and their successors furnish a serviceable account of human beings as anxious social creatures and more or less correctly identify some of the roles that religion plays in human life. But this merely marks out the playing field within which human beings explore whatever intimations of ultimate meaning they experience. Now let's turn more briefly to the evolutionary dimensions of this first theoretical issue. Evolutionary biology leads us to step back and ask how we develop the capacities for religious and spiritual experiences. Are they adaptations that help us to survive and reproduce? Or are they side effects of a big brain cognitive system? The field of evolutionary psychology which has sprung up in recent years has a lot to say about this. I, too, will have a lot to say about it in subsequent lectures. For now, I wish to note an often overlooked fact, namely, that evolutionary psychology has not yet found a way to answer the question of the significance of religious and spiritual experiences. Let's suppose that our capacities for religious and spiritual experiences are adaptations. That is, these capacities evolve specifically because having religious and spiritual experiences helped people in the long Pleistocene era of human evolution to survive and reproduce. Some experts speak as if this guarantees that religious and spiritual experiences are delusory. The thinking here seems to be that the adapted character of such experiences rules out the possibility that they are essentially spontaneous and recurring reactions to actual spiritual realities that lie beyond the reach of the regular senses. Yet other experts write as if adaptation guarantees the reliability of religious and spiritual experiences, likening them to the ordinary senses such as sight and hearing, which are generally reliable. Well, which is it? Does the adaptation hypothesis support the anti-religious skeptic or the pro-religious devotee? I think compelling evidence to resolve this question does not yet exist. So it is worrying that some experts eagerly jump on one bandwagon and speak as if there is no compelling alternative. Now let's suppose that the most important types of religious and spiritual experiences are not adaptations, that is, Biological capacities for religious and spiritual experiences did not evolve because the experiences were adaptive, but for other reasons entirely. The big brain cognitive system was selected for its ability to detect patterns, make decisions, gather food, find mates, stay safe, that sort of thing. Religious and spiritual experiences are a mere side effect of a system adapted for those other functions. Just as a train engine throws off noise, even though its primary purpose is locomotion. How should we regard religious and spiritual experiences in this case? <clears throat> well, as in the adaptation case, given the state of evidence at this point, I think this question can be argued both ways. 
On the one hand, most things of cultural value, such as dance recitals in elementary school or fabulous cooking, the artful carving of stone or no hitters in baseball, are side effects of biological capacities that are evolved for other purposes. Why should religious and spiritual experiences be any different? On the other hand, we have no reason to trust the cognitive content of religious and spiritual experiences if they are unselected side effects of a big brain cognitive system. And that suggests that they could easily be deeply misleading. What's the bottom line? We need more evidence, better experiments to settle these evolutionary questions. Or historians and anthropologists with time machines. Now, some religious people feel driven to reject these psychosocial and evolutionary accounts of human life in order to protect religion. I can see how some people might feel threatened by such accounts, particularly if they are attached to perfect assurance commensurate with belief in supernatural powers that transcend the messiness of human life. The modern evolutionary view of human nature can certainly seem to taint that perfect assurance. But I think that rejecting these theories out of hand amounts to a self-protective denial of the obvious and an unnecessary denial as well. I am drawn to the world of Freud and Durkheim and evolutionary psychology. We come to life in this world, marked by our evolutionary history, heavily influenced by impulses we don't fully understand, by contexts that we can't fully control. And it is in these circumstances that we strive to discover meaning and purpose in our lives, to build creative cultures and secure societies, to realise the good, the true and the beautiful. To me, these are religious and spiritual activities, and we work out our salvation, our liberation and our enlightenment as we pursue them. The second point on our compass of theoretical issues concerns the effects of religious and spiritual experiences. Well, now, they have social, historic, economic, political consequences. No one living in the USA after September 11, 2001 doubts that. They have behavioural, emotional and existential functions from character transformation to moral orientation. They may even have consequences for mental and physical health, a controversial claim that becomes more intelligible as the psychosomatic dimensions of human life are better understood. The leading questions for researchers in this area are two. First, what precisely are these functional effects? And second, how precisely are they mediated through brains, bodies and groups? Regarding this first question, we just have to get our facts straight. Of course, it's easier to detect the effects of some things than others. The causal relationship that marks the link between behaviour and a consequence is often quite obvious because we can observe it. Beliefs and experiences are much trickier, however. One reason for this difficulty is the involvement of the brain, which synthesises numerous factors and influences into decisions and actions, many beneath the level of consciousness, and in ways that are very hard to observe. This familiar fact of mental life means that researchers cannot easily take subjective self-reports about the effects of religious and spiritual experiences at face value. Another reason for the difficulty is that we can't experiment on people, at least not easily. To explain why this matters, I'd like you to consider with me a hypothetical medical study testing the theory that Vegemite speeds recovery from stroke. We get the idea for such a study, perhaps from a pilot study in which we noticed a strange correlation between Australians who eat Vegemite and rapid recovery from stroke. But now we want a carefully controlled study to test this apparent connection. So we recruit stroke patients and randomly assign them to two groups who receive different treatments. The test group receives the regular regimen of treatment plus a daily cracker spread with Vegemite. The control group receives the regular regimen of treatment plus a daily cracker spread with a placebo, something harmless that looks and tastes like Vegemite. Just to be safe, we don't tell anyone involved with the patients which crackers have Vegemite and which don't. If the two groups are large enough, then you can see that the natural variations in the two groups should be about the same in both, and the only variable factor will be the daily Vegemite cracker. 
if there is a correlation between the test group and a particular health outcome relative to the control group, we can be fairly confident that the Vegemite is the reason why. Then we can notify the Surgeon General that one Vegemite cracker a day does in fact keep the doctor away. That is standard procedure in medical studies, but how are we supposed to do this with religious beliefs, behaviours and experiences? The reason the controversy over the health effects of smoking took so long to resolve is precisely that we can't just randomly assign people to a test group of smokers and a control group of non-smokers. We can observe smokers versus non-smokers, but they won't be random groups. That will make it difficult to be sure that smoking causes the health differences between the two groups. You can see, can't you, that there may be a more fundamental cause that leads people to smoke cigarettes and also gives them emphysema, lung cancer and heart disease. For example, perhaps they eat too much Vegemite. The very same problem applies to the effects of religious and spiritual behaviours, beliefs and experiences. Consider the often alleged health effects of religion, for example. We can't get random groups of people who are religious and non-religious. The groups are self-selecting. But we can design a study that discovers a correlation between, say, attendance at religious services and longevity. In fact, George Comstock, a well-known epidemiologist from Johns Hopkins University, conducted just such a study, which is now famous, in 1963. Several years later, he reported that a significant relationship existed between participation in religious services and longevity. But later, it occurred to Comstock that the reason he found a correlation is that many people who are sick cannot attend church. So Comstock duly reported this in a later paper. Illness may in fact have been a confounder, as it's known, the cause of both low attendance at religious services and the cause of death. The apparent effect reported in the earlier study could have been a chimera, masking a deeper cause that produced the correlation. Richard Sloan, a famous critic of religion and medicine studies, laments that Comstock's first study is often cited, but the second study is almost completely neglected. Sloan believes this says something about people's motivations when they start looking for the health effects of religious behaviours, beliefs and experiences, and I'd have to say he's correct. We do need to be cautious in this area. There's no substitute for careful study design. And the ultimate research effort in this area, as with smoking, is a longitudinal study where you combine tons of different kinds of uh, pieces of data and evidence relevant to health, including things about religious behaviours, beliefs and experiences. That still won't produce the confidence of a randomised, double-blind, controlled study, which is what I described with the Vegemite case, but it is the best we can do when groups are self-selecting. Now regarding that second section as question, while we are getting our facts straight about the functional effects of religious and spiritual behaviours, beliefs and experiences, we would also like to understand the mechanisms that mediate those effects. Quite apart from satisfying curiosity, understanding these mediating mechanisms has great practical value. For example, if religious and spiritual experiences do in fact have positive health effects, and we discover the neural mechanisms that mediate these effects, then we are in a position to understand more clearly, quite specifically, how to improve health. Similarly, <clears throat> to understand the way the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences mediates effects, give policy planners new insights and opportunities. Now, it's especially important at this point to remember the complexity of religion and spirituality. Many studies purporting to detect a functional effect of religious and spiritual behaviours, beliefs and experiences conceive of religiosity in extremely broad ways. For example, there is some evidence that attendance at religious services extends life despite the problems with the Comstock study mentioned above. Let us suppose that medical experts achieve consensus on this point. What are the health policy experts supposed to do with this consensus? Attendance at religious services, like many other categories used in these studies, is quite vague. If it's the social relationships associated with attendance that matters, then the healthcare recommendations would be very different than if it were the worship and prayer dimensions of attendance that make the difference. We can test more detailed hypotheses and we can keep testing and testing interminably, but the complexity of religion makes this very difficult. Still, we have to grapple with that difficulty. 
Ultimately, we need to combine data about correlational studies with understanding of the neural and social mechanisms that mediate the effects of religious, spiritual behaviours, beliefs and experiences. Unfortunately, that ideal still hovers on the horizon of our scientific abilities. The third theoretical issue concerns epistemological questions. Are religious and spiritual experiences cognitively informative or illusory? Can they serve as supportive evidence for theological claims? Can they resolve age-old disputes between supernaturalistic and naturalistic views of reality? In short, are they modes of reliable knowledge or not? I'll be devoting an entire lecture to this subject, so I will not dwell on the details now, but I do want to make one remark about this emotionally charged theoretical issue. Many ordinary people rely on inspiration from religious and spiritual experiences to guide their day-to-day behaviours and moral choices. Typically, they do not have the luxury of treating the cognitive content of religious and spiritual experiences as a kind of constructed fiction while still counting on it for strength and comfort. Intellectuals might be able to pull off such an intellectual juggling act, but it requires an array of fine distinctions that just don't mean much to most people. Thus, it can be extremely disturbing for them to wonder whether they unconsciously attach to their experiences whatever cognitive content they need them to have. And it is doubly upsetting when they are accustomed to relying on those experiences for reassurance of the truth of their beliefs. It is no wonder that many people are deeply sensitive to the assertion that their precious and useful religious and spiritual experiences are delusions. This religion is delusion viewpoint has a strong media presence at the moment, giving contemporary voice to an ancient criticism of religion as superstition and wish fulfilment. This criticism is more than just scepticism. This is a full-blown attack on the epistemological and moral value of religious and spiritual experiences and of religion itself. In religious circles and in the vast blogosphere, there's a strong reaction, defending religion and the reliability of religious and spiritual experiences, building on the quieter work of a few key intellectuals such as Swinburne and Alston, Richard Swinburne and William Alston. But let's consider the attacks. They're in the news so much right now, you've no doubt heard of them and read about them. That's why I'm dealing with them so much in today's lecture. Harris writes the following lines in his letter to a Christian nation, addressing conservative Christians who are supernaturalists and biblical literalists. There is no question, he says, that it is possible for people to have profoundly transformative experiences. And there is no question that it is possible for them to misinterpret those experiences and to further delude themselves about the nature of reality. Now, how does Harris know this? Because... Billions of other human beings in every time and place have had similar experiences to blissful prayer, but they had them while thinking about Krishna or Allah or the Buddha, while making art or music or while contemplating the beauty of nature. Many thoughtful religious and spiritual people can really appreciate Harris's point. That's why it disturbs them so much. Yet they also believe that these experiences are meaningful and valuable. So they're left with a problem. How do they affirm both at once? How do they affirm the meaning and value of the experiences if their cognitive content is the result of an uncritical acceptance of overactive pattern-making capacities of the brain's remarkable simulation software? I will argue on another occasion that there is a way forward in this dilemma. But my point, but here, I just want to say this. It's a rather Buddhist point. Seen in the right light, the unreliability of cognitive interpretations of these experiences is beautiful, not disturbing. It creates an opening for intellectual and spiritual illumination. Religious and spiritual experiences are self-deconstructing when you pay close attention to them, and they draw our attention to the emptiness of experience and the religious and spiritual significance of that emptiness. But I'll come to that in another lecture, as I say. My point here is just to point out how existentially daunting these thoughts can be. The rhetoric of recent anti-religious writers is occasionally insulting and dismissive of religious and spiritual people, as we've seen. But they are generally compassionate human beings, and they're often quite reasonable, so they do not fail to notice the awkward existential problem that their arguments pose for religious and spiritual believers 
who rely on these experiences for reassurance and guidance. Dawkins has been quite straightforward about this. He makes the fair point that we should expect people who might be upset by anti-religious arguments to take them in stride with courage and dignity and simply adjust the way we all do when we encounter valid new information. He believes that this expectation conveys a high regard for the emotional strength and intelligence of his fellow human beings. In fact, I want to commend that attitude to all those who encounter awkward information about religious and spiritual experiences. It's so much in the press. As alarming as some of this information may seem at first, there is a way to accommodate it within a worldview that is simultaneously empirically adequate and spiritually compelling. And the key to this accommodation is to stress not the cognitive reliability of religious and spiritual experiences, but rather their function as one means of engagement with the depth and mystery of reality in the same way that all of our experiences have this potential. They are kinds of engagement. So the final point, on the final compass. This is a direction that scientists rarely travel, at least in public. But it is perhaps the most important issue of all for ordinary religious people. It concerns the ultimate spiritual significance of these experiences. Can they lead to salvation, liberation or enlightenment, as many claim? Can they bring authentic hope for a future life after death? Or do they merely comfort and inspire us while we endeavour to make the most of the present? This is now clearly a philosophical and theological issue and perhaps one that is immune to any direct impact from a scientific study of religion. So let us boldly enter the sometimes strange but always wonderful territory of theology and philosophy and try to make sense of these questions. Now let us admit from the outset that many people do not acknowledge the meaningfulness of religious goals such as salvation, liberation and enlightenment. Fine. Let us further admit that even theologians who take one or more of those goals seriously conceive the issues very differently. For example, supernaturalist theologians imagine an ontological arrangement of beings and powers, relations and transactions that can make literal sense of salvation and liberation narratives in a way that is quite alien to naturalist philosophical theologians. For their part, religious naturalists do not imagine heavens and hells or angels and demons under the supervision of a personal divine being. They regard such world pictures as improperly anthropomorphic projections of human experience onto a universe that actually is not scaled to human interests and concerns. Naturalists and supernaturalists have coexisted within every religious and philosophical tradition throughout the long history of human theological musing. Supernaturalists have been in the large majority in each tradition and they are currently as much in the majority as they ever have been, sadly. What is difficult and different about our era is that in addition to religious naturalists, there is a large group of anti-religious intellectuals who also defend naturalist worldviews and believe with varying degrees of militancy that, to use Hitchens' phrase, religion spoils everything. There have always been atheists and sceptics, but never had they had at their disposal a robust worldview. This is what scientific inquiry, global communication, modern medicine, historical knowledge and democratic political organisation has brought to birth. The medieval village atheist's view of the world was clearly parasitic upon the worldview that he or she rejected. A theist, not theist, but that is no longer so. In fact, Dennett has tried to introduce the name Bright to designate his spiritual identity, specifically in order to distance himself from the parasitic connotations of the word atheist. Admittedly, these are three very broad and diverse groupings. Supernaturalist Christians, for example, include both biblical literalists and moderates who take the Bible seriously but not literally. Anti-religious naturalists range from the religiously hostile to those who think religion serves useful social and existential functions. And religious naturalists, among whom I count myself, vary from philosophically-minded Buddhists such as Nagarjuna, who never used the concept of God, to philosophically-minded theists such as Aristotle, who gave what amounts to a naturalistic interpretation of the concept of God. Nevertheless, these three groups offer a serviceable description for my current purposes. I particularly appreciate the fact that this way of parsing things places me and my naturalist colleagues, past and present, right in the middle of two opposing camps. There is often something reassuring about being in the middle. 
if only because it suggests that everyone else is somehow extreme. But I am particularly interested here in making a double contrast with the views to either side of my religious naturalist perspective. On the one side within the pro-religion camp, a major difference between supernaturalists and religious naturalists in all traditions is that the former have traditionally relied, in part, on the cognitive content of religious and spiritual experiences to bolster their worldview. To that extent, supernaturalists have a lot at stake in the contemporary investigation of the cognitive reliability of those experiences. They will try to claim cognitive reliability, even while explaining away the apparent fact that people interpret qualitatively similar experiences in opposite ways. Alternatively, they will reduce their reliance on the evidential force of religious experience altogether and emphasise instead the supernatural authorization of sacred texts such as the Bible, the Quran or the Vedas, or else the supernatural establishment and maintenance of sacred communities such as the Catholic Church or the Buddhist Sangha. Following the German theologian Ernst Trelch, I have argued elsewhere that neither strategy is successful and that both involve special pleading on behalf of a favoured religious or spiritual tradition. You know how it goes. Our experiences are reliable, but yours are not. Our supernatural authorization is authentic, but yours is demonic. Such special pleading is more than implausible. It is repulsive and dangerous. Meanwhile, religious naturalists do not need to rely on the cognitive content of religious and spiritual experiences in order to authorize a supernatural worldview or for any other purpose. So they can live more easily with any finding about cognitive reliability. Naturalists are also fully committed to the neural and social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences. So there are no surprises lying in wait for them. But there can be surprises for supernaturalists who are committed to a supernatural soul and who struggle to articulate the body-soul connection forced upon them by the neural and social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences. So that's one side. On the other side, Though religious naturalists have a lot in common with the worldview of anti-religious scientists such as Dawkins and Stenger and Weinberg and Carl Sagan and others, there is a potent disagreement, as we've said, about the value of preserving religious communities and often a subordinate disagreement over the value of experiences. Anti-religious naturalists have been forced by their critics to be quite explicit about what they are attacking and what they are not. For example, Dawkins, Dennett and Harris are going after supernaturalist religion and the moderate religion that gives it cover. They specifically exempt religious people who reject the idea of God as a personal supernatural being, which includes religious naturalists such as me. But they have other, another critique for them, make that us. Dawkins complains that we religious naturalists in the theistic camp are disingenuous we use God in a way that does not conform to its most common usage, a big personal supernatural being. I am sure many personal supernatural theists would agree with Dawkins at this point. But why should religious naturalists surrender the word God, which has always been contested, simply turning it over to personalist supernaturalist theists because Dawkins says we should? We say it is a word worth fighting for. Of course, when you are trying to dismantle religion, it is difficult to have much sympathy for religious naturalists who want to defend the value of religious quests by maintaining continuity with traditional religious communities, religious language and symbols, religious rituals and practices, and religious and spiritual experiences. To Dawkins and his anti-religious co-conspirators, therefore, the religious naturalist is complicit in protecting an intellectual and moral disaster. To the religious naturalist, however, Dawkins and company are oversimplifying. At some point, they simply stopped asking good and pertinent questions. If we need to work hard to be good scientists, if we need to cultivate a skill set for art and literature, if we need to labour in defence of valuable institutions, then why should we not have to invest energy in the pursuit of spiritual quests? Cannot spiritual quests be pursued more and less expertly? And ought not the accrued wisdom of religious and spiritual traditions be relevant for the guidance of such quests? Their anti-religious naturalists speak as if the spiritual quest were an unimportant or trivial matter 
that, contrary to every other great human adventure, requires no institutional support, no traditional guidance. The religious naturalist demurs. So now I conclude with an appeal on behalf of the value of religious and spiritual experiences within the grand adventure of human life. The spiritual quests of humanity have been among the most passionate and prized pursuits in every culture and era, and that continues to be true today. The wisdom encoded in traditions is an essential resource for those quests, as are the institutions, rituals, symbols and ideas that those traditions accumulate. Even if religious and spiritual experiences do not reliably yield cognitive information that can be translated into doctrinal propositions, they still perform an invaluable function by engaging people with the ultimate mysteries to which they are drawn. Every part of human life, every aspect of human embodiment play roles in the seeker's quest to cultivate spiritual excellence. This quest will involve imperfect institutions such as religions. It will involve flawed mentors and ambiguous efforts at character transformation. It will involve mistaken metaphysics and odd ontologies. And it will involve experiences that engage us deeply without necessarily reliably informing us about deep spiritual truths. But the entire messy and complex process constitutes a profoundly valuable journey nonetheless through an awesome environment of existential and social and spiritual possibilities. And religious and spiritual experiences are among the most beautiful and captivating features of the landscape to be explored along the way. Thank you for listening. I appreciate your attention. and stimulating lecture. We have time for some questions. I'd ask that if you have a question that you wait until you have the microphone actually in your hand and in front of your mouth before asking it. We are recording. A mostly self-explanatory lecture then, <laughs> unlike the experiences it describes. Um, I, I really, um, by the way, I'm just asking a question to give your, you guys time to uh, think of your questions. But um, I, I really like that the little point you were making near the end there about how these uh, spiritual experiences are deconstructing. That is, they make us question, you know, you made the point about how uh, we don't do the global matching and figure out, well, I just had this strong experience, but it doesn't make sense the rest of my life. It's just so overwhelming that we just have to sort of accept it. And that that way, it's, it's a sort of a vehicle for, for change. And um, I was wondering if you would say something more about some of the experiences that you think are on the continuum that people, in terms of they may not be identified as religious or spiritual, but they may be... Uh, you know, just just give us a sense of what those hmm. might be like. I mean, I'm thinking of things like it could even be something like a, a very deeply falling in love feeling, for example, like an intense uh, emotional commitment mm -hmm. to a person could be one example. But I thought I was wondering if you had some examples. Hmm. Uh, the story that was told to me by my scientist friend was just such an example. I won't relate the story because it's private, but it's a case of someone who never even dawned on them to describe themselves as religious, but they were struck by an experience that involved extremely powerful emotions and some uh, ideational content that was um, a, a blindingly new, novel, unexpected, untraceable, could not see uh, the, the sort of causal precursors for it at all. Now, that's a spectacular one. But actually, there are also relatively plain, ordinary experiences that people who are not religious have all the time. Walking in nature, I've got lots of non-religious friends who love what we in Australia call bushwalking. So bushwalkers, uh, uh, something like, what, what do you call them? Just hiking or something? Boots, hikers, is that it? So they're walking through the woods and you come across a beautiful glade, it just opens up before you and you feel this unaccountable sense of gratitude. It's not actually directed to a supernatural personal being, it's a kind of non-directed gratitude. But it feels like it establishes a connection between you and nature. 
And that, in a certain sense, opens up the depths of nature to your experience. Without that, that experience, which some people are so quick to delegitimate or make fun of or belittle, you never have that encounter with nature in such a way that makes you feel bonded to it. And that is a, a revelation to many people. Now, almost everyone working on a Greenpeace boat trying to stop people from killing whales in the Arctic Ocean or something have had an experience like that at some time in their life, even though they are profoundly anti-religious themselves. So there's a couple of examples. David? What you've just described, Wesley, about an experience of nature reminds me of my undergraduate thesis about the concept of the sublime in 18th century British landscape poetry. Would you like to tell us when you wrote that thesis? <laughs> I'll tell you privately, Wesley. That's one of those experiences we can't pass on. Uh, and the, the argument in, in uh, that literature in the 18th century was that uh, you could have these direct experiences of, of the natural world. And they were actually talking about something uh, that's different from beauty. It's sublimity. Yeah. It's very large. It stretches the senses. And it gives an impression of infinity that really was perceived in the 18th century as being um, uh, a strong indication of what the presence of the divine might be. Right. Something large, something terrifying, something awesome, and yet something also that was loving and beautiful and, and, and so on. Uh, what struck me at the time was that that was uh, a historically very contingent notion. Mm -hmm. It was something that arose in the 18th century in response to certain kinds of, of scientific and philosophical developments that were, that were distinctively appropriate to that era. And I wonder if you can historicize for us somewhat the concept of religious experience itself. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a concept that that is uh, particularly significant in certain historical periods and not in others? If so, why is it such a significant experience or a significant concept to us today in the world um, of the Enlightenment and beyond? I do think there are historical circumstances that condition the way religious experience is talked about. But I do think it's also one of those uh, categories of experience that's pretty stable across history. Most sacred documents uh, make reference to religious experiences in all kinds of different ways and aspects. And you can usually find antecedents for things that seem so distinctively 19th century. Um, uh, St. Francis with the birds, for example. Um, there, there are, uh, there are um, good reasons, I think, to imagine that this, experience, this kind of experience is so primal it's so common across cultures that it's also um, uh, that it's also more or less a constant feature of human life. However, the historicization um, aspect kicks in when you start asking yourself why would we be especially interested in, relig in religious experiences in the way we are now? The way we are now involves especially whether or not they have health effects, whether or not they are delusions whether or not you can have a new age spiritual religion that eschews the craziness of traditional religions and still guide your life properly. I mean, these are living questions for people. So I think in each of the three examples I just gave, you can trace an historical circumstance that makes it important. It might be the development of neurophysiology, which raises new questions about religious and spiritual experiences that weren't there before. Or it might be the collapse of the hold of traditional religions over ordinary people, and yet they still have a spiritual longing that they now have to, have to meet in some new way. I would say that the historicization, the burden of that consists in contextualizing the way we ask questions about it and the way it works itself out in our own lives. I'm thinking, I'm thinking back to your earlier question um, of the motivations and how they should avoid becoming biases in experience. And has the question come up in this current study of this kind of academic overview of experience becoming another bias in itself? That is, should this type of endeavor avoid becoming a bias? If so, how does it do that? Would it be a matter of um, adequately keeping interpretations at a level that different experiences can still relate to so as to not caricature these different types of experience being analyzed? 
Um, and if it does come down, the study with certain judgments, how does it validate them without becoming one of the bad motivations that you tried to avoid? Mm. Um, just in passing, the motivations I mentioned, I didn't think were either bad or good, but merely facts of life, and we have to guard for them. But, but um, can I re-express the question in this way? Uh, you could uh, spend a lot of time as an academic. In fact, you can spend decades doing this. People have come up with a conclusion about religious and spiritual experiences, publish your definitive work, and uh, it sort of remains your central conviction about that topic forever after. Um, uh, subsequent work pretty effortlessly shows that it's one-sided, biased, limited, or something, right? This happens all the time in this business. My goodness, we're so vulnerable to critiques from other and smarter people than ourselves. So. Um, First of all, the thing to say about that is we count on that. We absolutely depend on encountering people who are going to say to us, no, you really missed the boat on that one. You, you, you missed this key point, you should have considered this thing, or whatever it might be. Or thank goodness the neurosciences came along to give us this new angle on this other thing, whatever it might be. So um, I, I think the, uh, the way to think about the whole enterprise being fundamentally biased is to stretch it out over time and understand it as a conversation among lots of different perspectives, lots of different disciplines, lots of different types of expertise in which there is a kind of bouncing around and the formation of consensus over a long period of time. The consensus may never be achieved in some kind of final or absolute sense, but so long as you're on the move, keeping in touch with the past and responding to pressures in the present, you actually can produce better rather than worse interpretations. And if it weren't for that, if it weren't for the hope of better rather than worse, not absolutely good, but just better rather than worse, then it's hard to imagine how any of us would even get into this business. Time for one more. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was struck when you were describing um, RSEs and was thinking about um, the Diagnostic and st Statistical Manual um, and defini definitions in the dsm 4 of trauma mm. as including all the elements of overwhelming experiences that fall outside the range of normal human experience and the, the kind of uh, controversies over that definition, but I was wondering, and the subsequent, all the brain imaging being done on um, on persons who experience trauma, and I've just wondered, um, you may be getting to it in your spirituality and the brain talk, but um, but the connection between what most people think of as in P PTSD as a kind of shattering of basic trust. Hmm and meaning in the world as a response versus I think what you're talking about is a kind of transcendence, an experience of transcendence. Um, and how could you talk about the, the similar definitions but the very different effects? Each of the remaining five lectures chooses one little area and dives deep. And it's the third lecture that I'll be talking about these kinds of things. In fact, the qualitative, the second on this list, of course, is what that means. Um, the qualities of religious and spiritual experiences are not just positive by any means. In fact, there are mystics who report experiences of the shattering of identity that are not that dissimilar from the, um, from the experiences of uh, victims of a violent crime of some kind who go through some kind of traumatic shattering of identity and the ability to remember and certain other things. Um, the difference is that it's very difficult to see what the cause of it is. And so there's, and there's not obviously sort of an ethical angle on it in the same way that there is uh, uh, in trauma. Uh, but there is no question that these experiences do actually start to merge at a certain level um, uh, when they're sufficiently uh, negative and when they're sufficiently disruptive of ordinary patterns and ordinary uh, ways of remembering and understanding. Um, what's I feel very sensitive about that issue because I don't want to trivialise trauma. And that's why I was careful to distinguish between an experience where there is clearly a moral angle and one where the moral angle is obscure or perhaps not even present. So there is a very important difference there. But phenomenologically, 
there are some very strange and intriguing commonalities between different kinds of experiences that I think invite, invite um, some pretty interesting reflections by theologians who are interested in trauma. Um, I wouldn't hesitate to say this um, any other place than a broadly public lecture. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, I think it's possible to imagine, not to say that it always happens or that it should happen, but to imagine that trauma in the technical sense of something horrible happening to you that shatters you, that that might actually be transformative in an ultimately healthy way if handled properly, if worked out properly. It might actually be capable of having a kind of spiritual liberative aspect to it. But fighting for that liberation, fighting for that insight is a very, very difficult journey for people who've been through violent crime or something like that. And so it's very important not to say that too cavalierly. But I do still mean what I say, that even those violent experiences can have transformative effects that are spiritually positive in the long run, in the right kind of community, with the right kind of uh, help. Thank you so much for listening.